magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent, and this is the unit focus video on striking scorpions. In these videos, I do a deep dive on what the unit is, its role on the table, the obstacles to using it effectively, and the best ways to overcome those obstacles. Striking scorpions are heavily armored stealth melee warriors that specialize in ambushing enemy bikes or infantry and slaughtering them in brutally one-sided close combat encounters. Although the original scorpion sculpts had helmets that were designed to look like fey scorpion tails posed to strike, the more recent models are evocative of the eponymous anti-hero of the Predator franchise. One of the glories of 40k is the ability of the IP to be fresh and unique, while somehow also being arguably the most derivative major sci-fi franchise in existence. At some point, I'll dedicate a video to exploring this particular rabbit hole for those of you interested in aspects of the hobby other than tabletop tactics. But for now, we'll stick to the particulars of everybody's favorite, favorite sneaky aspect warriors. After all, I wouldn't want to upset any of the busy horse dentists out there who are already listening to these segments on 1.5 speed to suck out the tactical nuggets like Gollum slurping the entrails from a particularly slippery fish. Okay, so scorpions. Scorpions have the standard stat line for melee aspects with weapon skill three and three attacks, but also a scorpion chain sword that conveys plus one attack, taking them to four attacks, plus two strength, taking them to five, and minus one AP at one damage. On top of this, the whole squad has the sustained assault ability, which conveys exploding sixes. Now, for those newbie autarchs out there, exploding sixes means that each six to hit generates two hits, rather than one. Furthermore, when attacking a target that does not have the vehicle or monster keyword, scorpions can trigger the mandiblasters ability. Uh, mandiblasters are shooty little murder mandibles on their helmets. The mandib mandiblasters cause each roll of a six to wound, six rolls to wound, to do a mortal wound in addition to the standard damage. So the dice become a little complicated here because the additional hits generated by sustained assault may not trigger the Manda Blaster effect, which means that you need to remember to make the wound rolls for your additional hits separately from the general dice pool. Uh, I'm sure that GW did not initially intend for the process to be this complicated. I feel certain that this is a limitation that was added as a nerf applied after play testing, so it gets a little crazy. You you roll to hit, any of your sixes generate extra hits, but you set those dice off to the side and, and roll them separately because they can't trigger Manda Blasters. The overall result is that in, a, in an MSU squad, MSU unit is just five scorpions, the overall result is that the four non-Exarch scorpions in, in that squad are putting out 16 attacks, resulting in an average about of about 13 strength five hits, because of the exploding sixes, it's a little bit more than what would be normally. And then against most infantry and bikes, this is going to translate into about eight successful wounds. Most of the time, they're going to be wounded on a three up uh, before armor saves, plus two mortal wounds. Uh, but as as with Banshees, the Exarch is likely to deliver the majority of the squad's damage, or maybe like 60% of the squad's damage. So th there are two alternative weapon loadouts for the Striking Scorpion Exarch, uh, and of course, the standard three. Well, technically, there are three weapon loadout options because you could leave the Scorpion X arc with a standard uh, pistol and chainsaw, but you would never do that, except in one bizarre circumstance, which I'll talk about. Uh, so you've got the, the two loadouts and then the three X arc powers. So theoretically, there are six different builds, and I'll talk a little bit about all of them, but there's one that obviously stands out as the best. The first and universally agreed upon best loadout for the Striking Scorpion Exarch is the Biting Blade for five points plus uh, Crushing Blows, which is the, the Exarch power. So the Biting Blade conveys plus two strength, minus two AP instead of minus one, flat two damage, and two extra attacks. And if you also select the Exarch power Crushing Blows for 15 points, your Exarch gets a total of seven attacks because when you give an, give an Exarch any upgrade, they get plus one to their wounds characteristic and then plus one to either their attacks 
characteristic of their ballistic skill for the scorpions. These are attacks. So the Exarch's uh, attack characteristic goes up one for crushing blow, plus two for the chain sword, taking the Exarch to a seven. So you're rolling seven dice on sixes. You're generating additional hits. Uh, and the way crushing blows works, anything that hits auto wounds, which is amazing. It is true, however, that any additional hits that are generated by sixes to hit, those don't auto wound. You you'd still have to roll for those because of an, uh, a rare rule in, in the core book. Uh, so the only drawback to this build is that the Exarch can never actually do any Manda Blaster damage because your initial hits are auto wounding and then so you're never rolling those dice and then your sustained assault uh, hits are not eligible but despite that limitation if you run the math you'll find that this build is still going to put the hurt on any target literally better than any any other build that you you might consider although there is simply no question that this one is the best i will briefly discuss the other loadouts because a lot of people listening to these videos uh are also interested in casual play or maybe they just you're running multiple squads and only one of those squads can be can be built with that op optimal build so let's talk about the other options um, as I said, you technically have the option to equip your Exarch with a standard chain sword and pistol and save five points on the biting blade. But the only reason you would ever do this is that you're using second edition miniatures that are modeled without any upgrades and you are determined to run them as they are modeled or as we often say in the community, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Uh, but, but that's an aesthetic decision. So I, I'm not, it's not a tactical choice. I'm not going to talk about that one. You, it's a thing you could do. The only other loadout option is the scorpion claw which despite being twice as expensive as the biting blade at 10 points is objectively worse in conjunction with crushing blow the cheapest and best of the exarch power options uh without crushing blow it's roughly equivalent um well it we'll we'll see so it, it doesn't convey the extra two attacks uh so you're, you're not getting any bonus attacks, but it is strength six instead of strength five. So sometimes that's going to matter. And it has plus three AP instead of, uh, or minus three AP, excuse me. That would be really terrible if it was a bonus to your opponent's armor save. Minus three AP instead of minus two. Uh, and like the Biting Blade, it does two damage. But unlike the Biting Blade, which if, if you're running the Biting Blade, it's like a two-handed chainsword. So you don't get your normal pistol shot. Uh, the claw provides the equivalent of two shuriken pistol shots in the shooting phase. So you've, you've got the two shuriken pistol shots that do one damage, strength four, minus one, unless you roll sixes like all shuriken weapons. And then you've got the uh, slightly harder hitting five attacks in close combat, which have one better strength and one better AP. But the vast majority of the time, you're just going to be better off having the two additional attacks, which with crushing blow are doing more damage than than the shuriken pistol um also the fact that the biting blade is just five points cheaper uh if, if there was any question that settles it right there but you you want more you want more attacks is what it comes down to the the claw is not bad like if you if you have i have an exarch modeled with the claw i think it looks really cool um you certainly and there's certainly no reason you couldn't run it it's not like a it's not like a big disadvantage but certainly in more competitive games uh you, you're your scorpions are going to do better if you give them the biting blade. That's that's just the truth. Aside from crushing blow, there are two other Exarch powers to choose from, only one of which is seriously worth considering, and only if you've already got the one uh, squad with the optimal build, un unless you're playing casually. For 20 points, you could take the deadly ambush exarch power which conveys plus one to hit and plus one ap if the entire squad is wholly within an area terrain feature in addition of course uh giving any exarch power to the unit conveys the other bonuses that i that i already mentioned the bonus from deadly ambush is nice but if you're hoping to use your scorpions for a turn one assault the problem is you're unlikely to be able to make use of the 
the, the bonus. On, on tournament boards, the first floor of ruins are usually considered to be opaque, and so your opponent is likely to deploy in such a way that it's not possible for you to maneuver your scorpions wholly within a terrain feature and still be within engagement range of, of the enemy. And even if it is possible, it's unlikely that one engageable unit that your opponent might have somewhere uh, will be the most like viable target for your scorp the scorpions the one that you most want to ambush with your little green anthropod cosplayers probably isn't going to be the one that um, potentially your opponent is letting you get to so i i at least find that one of the greatest advantages to scorpions is this forward deploy power which we're going to talk about later which allows them to just jump something on the first turn and this this particular extra power just doesn't have good synergy with that. Uh, generally speaking, if you are running scorpions with deadly ambush, it's not bad. It's just it, it sort of takes all. It, it you're not in a lot of games you're not going to be using it to best effect. But but if you're going to use it, you're better off starting those starting those scorpions either in deep strike or maybe like in reserve with the webway stratagem, or maybe they are in a transport um, like a wave serpent. There's some very competitive players who almost exclusively start them in Wave Serpents, curiously. Uh, and if you are bringing them in from Deep Strike, I've mentioned in other videos, you can auto-succeed bringing a, a melee unit in from Deep Strike on a charge by casting Ghost Walk for plus two to charge and using a Strands of Fate die uh, to guarantee a roll of a six on one of the two dice. So the worst thing you could end up with a nine, which gets you there. Um, this, this is a totally solid way to, to potentially play Scorpions. And after turns one and two, you're more likely to be able to position them such that they are in terrain. They're attacking something that's in terrain. Maybe you can get some use out of Deadly Imp. But there's simply no question that it's not as good as Crushing Blow. So if you're taking one squad and it's uh, a more competitive environment, you want Crushing Blow. And then if for whatever reason you're taking a second squad of Scorpions, theoretically, you could you could consider this. As for the final Exarch power option, Scorpion Sting, it is wildly overpriced for what it does. This power replaces the Manda Blaster ability on the Exarch only with a version that triggers on an unmodified wound roll of 5 up instead of a 6 up. And it also works against monsters now. Uh, that sounds good because it's doubling the output of the mortal wounds on the Exarch, but even with the Biting Blade, which gets your Exarch's attack characteristic to 7, uh, you're still only likely to generate one additional mortal wound, which is pretty paltry because you figure, like, if you roll 7 dice, uh, statistically you're going to roll 1 5. So that you're, you're putting out one more mortal wound than you would have before. Um, and that's pretty paltry for a 30-point upcharge it certainly doesn't compare well to just auto wounding with all of your hits you're, you're probably uh that first power is half as expensive as scorpion sting and likely to increase your damage output more against virtually any target i think that the 30 point price tag was probably designed for an earlier version of the power that affected the whole squad and that it got nerfed in play testing but they never changed the cost of the power because it's just wildly out of step with pretty much everything else in the book there, there are a few places in the book where it looks like something like that happened with an, a particular ability or a particular model where the thing got nerfed but then they didn't go back and adjust the, the point value in competitive play at least the correct number of scorpion units if you plan to include any is one uh and it has an exarch with the biting blade excuse me exarch uh I've mentioned in earlier videos, I started playing this game in middle school. I had no idea how anything was pronounced in the second edition codex. And I still sometimes find myself saying things the way I said them when I was 11. It's not that I don't know better. Uh, or 12. The Biting Blade and Crushing Blow is your best option. If you decide to include an additional Scorpion unit, you could consider those alternative uh, loadouts. But at that point, you're making a decision for aesthetic or narrative reasons, not tactical ones. Uh, when you're deciding on melee units for your army i'm telling you right now that you're the if you're only taking one you want the banshees with uh piercing strike and the mirror swords and then if you're adding a second melee unit most people do you're looking at probably a unit of scorpions they're great you could do a second unit of banshees you could do shining spears um 
for a lot of competitive players, this unit of scorpions is the go-to for melee unit number two, and most people want at least two in their list. Uh, if what you really want is another unit that does something like what scorpions do, instead of taking another unit of scorpions, consider taking striking scorpion phoenix lord Karen Dross. There is no more terrifying Karen than Karen Dross. And having grown up in Connecticut, I'm a bit of an expert on Karens. I'm telling you, this is the scariest Karen there is. Karen Dross is uh, slightly out of fashion at the moment in competitive play, but he has appeared in numerous winning lists over the past few months. There's no reason he could not do so again. Uh, he, he plays pretty much the same way that scorpions do but he has all the fun phoenix lord stuff he's damage gated so he can't take more than three in a phase he's like the scorpion exarch but he does even more damage uh there's a, a stratagem that lets you for one cp have a 50 percent chance of resurrecting a phoenix lord he's a little expensive but uh but he'll do some great work for you so if, if you do want two frontline ambushy scorpion unit options you, you take a unit of scorpions and then you, you throw in the Phoenix Lord. That's going to be much more competitive than a straight up second unit of uh, of Scorpions. But one unit is highly competitive, great build, lots of fun, adds depth and color and new ways to play any list. One of the fun things about Scorpions, I'll say this again at the end because I, I love when this is true, they, they will fit well in pretty much any list you could possibly run from any craft world. Uh, okay, let's discuss how to best actually use these iconic aspect warriors, not just not just how to outfit them for, for the game. So, Striking Scorpions have the Advanced Positions ability, which I mentioned earlier, which means they can be deployed in the midfield anywhere up to 9 inches from enemy models and the enemy deployment zone. This means that they can move and then charge on turn 1, with a 100% chance of engaging the enemy if you get first turn, which is ideal. If you don't get first turn and you set your, your scorpions up to jump something, then obviously you use Phantasm. That's the stratagem that for a couple of CP lets you pick up three units and either redeploy them or put them into reserve for free. Uh, so you use Phantasm to pick up your Scorpions, and I guess if you're running him, Karen Dross, and a couple of other units. And there, there are lots of good targets. Most people pick up Rangers with Phantasm because you can then redeploy them and uh, scout the enemy. To the Rangers are mostly a scoring unit. I, I'm sure you you don't need to tell me to tell you what to redeploy. With it. There's I, there's other stuff in your list. Your D cannons potentially. Uh, there, there's always stuff that that benefits. From this potentially uh, if your scorpions get picked up either they're going to go in your deployment zone or they're going to go into reserve now if they go into reserve plan to bring them in with strands of fate and the ghost walk psychic power to guarantee the nine inch charge just like i mentioned before uh, if you put them in your deployment zone you can move them out of line of sight into the midfield so turn one they they they're going to move up into the midfield keep their head down and you just keep them there as a melee counter puncher and or scoring unit so they're like hovering just in front of your deployment zone if your opponent moves anything into the midfield you can jump it with your scorpions if it's a good trade uh or they can keep their head down and help you score something like scout the enemy um and then in the late game then they can come out and and just be a real terror on the field when your opponent has less to deal with them because they're a really scary close combat unit. Uh, so in, in the mid and late game, that unit of striking scorpions that redeployed to your uh, deployment zone, if you haven't used them in the midfield as a training unit, then they just become a, a hyper aggressive like bully unit in the, the last part of the game. And that's kind of the worst case scenario and they'll still earn their points even if that's what they end up doing generally alternatively i guess your, your one other option here is if you're running a wave serpent after you pop the the howling banshees that are definitely in there out of the wave serpent i like to also put uh dire avengers in mind but there are lots of options but after you pop one of those units out the msu unit of scorpions can get in and you can move the wave serpent somewhere in the midfield and then they can jump out in the late game theoretically that's also a really solid play and if you're already running the wave serpent 
the scorpion, the redeployed scorpions have synergy with these other units in your list. It doesn't really cost you anything probably because I, I doubt you had tw two squat full, like 12 models worth of stuff to get back into the wave serpent after it deploys something for the first time. So that's just, that's just another tactical option available to you. I will say, uh, if you are using phantasm to redeploy your scorpions, you cannot set them up again in the midfield. Okay, you they you, they have to go to your deployment zone or into phantasm. You cannot use advanced positions once the deployment phase is over, unless you live in the UK apparently and are playing in a tournament-oriented club. Uh, the UKTC ruled in November that in tournament play in the UK, units with advanced positions can redeploy outside of their deployment zone when using an ability like Phantasm. It is worth pointing out, though, that this is not a interpretation of the rules. It's a rewrite of the rules, which are specifically phrased to state that advanced positions only works during, quote, the deployment phase. And the deployment phase is over by the time you would be using Phantasm. Uh, the fact of the matter is, however, that TOs, tournament organizers, can decide whatever they want for their own tournaments. Uh, the UKTC could decide tomorrow that, like, Space Marines only have one wound in their tournaments, or that Eldritch Storm does 66 mortal wounds to everything in your opponent's army. It None of that changes the official GW rules. Uh, it's... So, if, if you play in a UKTC tournament or at a UK club where UKTC rules are standard, congratulations, your Scorpions can redeploy in the midfield. Uh, but a decision that the UKTC makes has absolutely no bearing on official GW rules or standards for play in, in other countries. And so if, you know, if you live in Iowa, don't go to your local club and insist that your Scorpions can deploy in the, in the midfield. That's It's awkward and uh, kind of not super cool. Um, okay. So let's talk for a moment about what happens if you do get first turn, because ideally, most of the time, that's going to be what you want. Uh, well, for your scorpions, there are lots of reasons to like going second as an elder player. One of the, actually one of the re I'll, I wasn't going to talk about this, but one of the reasons I like having scorpions on my list is as an elder player, I often want to go second. I want my opponent to have to extend themselves a little bit into the midfield and then just get totally blown away by my uh, nippy, sneaky, killy, fragile murder elves. But having forward deployed scorpions like gives you a reason to be excited no matter who gets first turn. If you get first turn, it's, ooh, I get to do fun stuff with my scorpions. Uh, and if you don't, it's like, well, my scorpions won't get to do the fun thing and it costs me two CP, but now you have to come into my house and die, Monk High. Like that's, that's cool too. So it's... It's fun. It's like you, you cover your bases by having another good uh, first turn option. Okay, let's talk about... Um, incidentally, for those of you wondering why I don't like first turn as an Elder player, it isn't just the killing. Also, because uh, Craft Worlds does most of its primary objective scoring in turns four and five, the ability to score primary objectives at the end of turn five generally guarantees you being able to max it, like go 12 on those. And oftentimes we need that in order to get two or close to 45 for primaries. So it is, it's nice to go second as a, as a craft world player. Okay. Uh, so you do get first turn ideally and for, for your scorpions only, uh, and, and you get to celebrate. I, I routinely play games in which on turn one, my scorpions wipe out an enemy fast attack unit, uh, often bikes or cavalry. If my opponent makes a deployment error, sometimes my scorpions pick up a key enemy HQ. Not only does this mean your opponent loses something of equal or greater value to the scorpions before the battle really begins, but it also means that then on their own first turn, your opponent has to hold stuff back to deal with the scorpions. So you're both getting ahead in terms of points and tools. And then you're also getting ahead in, in terms of like initiative, what units are able to do. Uh, there, there's more to it, which I'll talk about a, a little bit later, but that's, that's the initial sell. And an additional advantage to crushing blow as the Exarch power pick is that your scorpions can now put some wounds on those vehicle and monster units that were previously off limits to them. Because conceptually, scorpions really are like infantry killers and bike killers. That's 
that's that's where they are and then when you trip them out with crushing blow suddenly that damage profile greatly expands the the possible targets that they're well suited to dealing with now you can go and target some big bad monster instead of just infantry or bikes i mean five aspect warriors are not going to single-handedly kill a tyranid big bug uh but with those seven attacks that auto wound on hits and deliver flat two damage your green carapace elf ninjas really do pose a serious threat in a way that they they didn't before they can you know the excerpt alone can drop like six wounds on something big and then maybe the uh the other infantry put another two or three on there and you've done eight or nine wounds to some super tough thing that maybe starts the game with 12 or 13 before things have even really gotten going and if you get lucky maybe you will take it down but it's it's not super statistically likely alternatively you might be able to destroy a transport or tie up and seriously damage some large base combat vehicle which creates a log jam in your opponent's backfield so if you have in, in my last game for example i had some banshees get in front of this big ridiculous orc vehicle that uh they certainly weren't or my banshees excuse me scorpions they certainly weren't going to kill it but they did some real damage and then my my opponent couldn't get any of his orc stuff out of his deployment zone and it was all just kind of like gummed up there on turn one which gave gave me initiative and, and he was never able to to bounce back from that so there, there are a lot of tricks you can pull with uh with a, a turn one move with the scorpions um also just those the the big tank or the big monster that's a, a clutch unit in your opponent's list sometimes reducing the profile on that too can be um can be a good move with your suicidally brave aspect warrior vanguard uh it's also worth considering that with a couple of sixes on strands of fate die even if what your your scorpions jumped was like some big powerful melee monster with a couple of auto succeeding saves it, you can probably have them survive a round of combat with with that um with that terrible big bad and that and that means that on your opponent's turn that thing is still stuck there your opponent's dealing with them and that um that makes it worthwhile so how do you how do you decide how do you decide what to target if if you've got a, a transport or a big vehicle you could gum up and a monster and there's some fast attack cavalry over there and and what what do i do so ideally of course you want your scorpions to choose something that is an important tool for your opponent in this particular matchup and which your aspect ninjas stand a good chance of killing or crippling in some way now obviously knowing what units these are like the best thing for you to target requires you to know quite a bit about your opponent's list and what it can do and sometimes especially for some of you newer players you're, you're not going to know those things so in matchups where you're just not sure i suggest prioritizing your opponent's fast attack units or units that provide big buffs, especially the ability to resurrect dead models, if you can if you can shut that down. I say fast attack because one of the most powerful advantages that you have as a Craft Worlds player is the ability to outmaneuver your opponent. As a result, the best counter units that your opponent is likely to have for your nippy space elves will be any of those that are equivalently fast or very fast even if they're not quite as fast as your elves that are going to like get into position to get lines of sight on things that you otherwise would be able to keep out of sight think like space marine bikes if you can trade your scorpions on turn one for your opponent's bike unit or your opponent's jump assault unit or whatever it is you're probably depriving her of her most important tool or one of her most important tools for dealing with the space elf threat and that is totally worthwhile as for uh characters i mentioned you know if you can kill an hq that provides buffs that's that's probably the move characters that provide buffs i mean i think the value here is obvious right like killing a character that buffs or resurrects enemy models doesn't just remove that hq as a unit for whatever point value it reduces the relative value of multiple other units in your opponent's list that may have only been included in the list but with the assumption that they would have access to those bonuses uh most opponents will be savvy enough to protect these characters first turn and you should certainly warn new opponents before the game begins that you have units that forward deploy like don't if you know your opponent is unlikely to know especially if they're a newer player 
don't just put your scorpions off to the side and not mention that you can set them up and that that's just that's uncool um but even if even with opponents that know or if you warn them some players will nevertheless nevertheless just kind of like misjudge how far your scorpions can really travel uh with a seven inch move and strands of fate to help you succeed on say a nine inch charge or maybe they just it just looks like five little dudes maybe they just kind of underestimate what they can what they can really do so people do make play errors that's a, that's a real thing uh so if you can pick up an hq that is is an essential buffing hq it's worth doing otherwise if you don't know what else to do kill the fast attack thing now setting up your scorpions to have access to a high value target may take cunning uh on on your part it, it it's less obvious than it sounds how this works the first question to ask yourself is does my opponent have forward deploying units of her own that could be used to screen out the scorpions so if your opponent has scout units that they can just she, she can start by putting in the midfield just far enough of in front of the deployment zone you just can't get your scorpions close enough for a turn and uh charge on turn one because you can't come down within nine inches of enemy models so that's that's one thing to consider if so if your opponent does have those units you want to start by using your rangers not your scorpions your rangers to screen out your opponent's ability to screen you out so if you put down some rangers nine inches from your opponent's deployment zone that's a that's a big like 18 inch bubble where your opponent can't put anything to screen you uh that's a big deal and you, you want to deploy those rangers before you put down anything else because you you want to stop your opponent. And the reason that you're using the rangers to do this and not just putting down the scorpions is you don't want to show your opponent where the scorpions are going. Don't show her until she's deployed most of her forces where you're putting your murder elf ninjas. Uh, if you want to be able to choose the juiciest target for your scouting murder elves, then you, you need to wait. Uh, you may even be using multiple units of rangers also to, to like block out multiple forward deployment options so your opponent doesn't know where the scorpions are going even if they have forward deploying units of their own to, to try to screen you because they're, the rangers create this big bubble between them where your, your scorpions could go in, in lots of places and creating uncertainty for your opponent is really important. Um, if you're worried, but Brent, then my Rangers will just like, even if I get first turn, what are the Rangers going to do? Won't they just die? Well, they can always make an advance move and run away, uh, to safety. And if they can't just, and that's a problem for you, just pick them up with phantasm, put them into reserve and then bring them in to score, scout the enemy later. Like it's great to have Rangers in, in, in reserve it's one of the most useful units you can possibly have in that situation so it's not it's not like a big sacrifice to use your rangers in that way um or or if you don't put them into reserve put them into your own backfield to screen out deep strikers if your opponent has those. there's there's plenty of good ways to redeploy rangers with phantasm on the other hand if your opponent doesn't have anything that forward deploys it's easier but you still want to hold your scorpions back until late in deployment even if your opponent deploys that unit that you most want to attack with your frontline aspect warriors uh you should still hold back because maybe your opponent just made a mistake and if you show her where your scorpions are going early enough she might be able to screen the target with something fragile and disposable or set something up to heroically intervene so at the very least she's set up to efficiently deal with the scorpions after they make their initial attack so resist the urge to triumphantly place your ambush aspects until after your opponent no longer has anything left to answer them in deployment also keep in mind that even if your opponent doesn't screen you out and even if you did get first turn sometimes your scorpions just won't have a good turn one target because Maybe your opponent isn't screening, but there's just isn't really anything there. She's in the back of her deployment zone. Or there's stuff, there's stuff that can happen. Or she is quite effectively screened and there was nothing you could do about it. But if at the end of the deployment phase there just isn't anything for your scorpions to hit, you use Phantasm, right? Don't don't just decide that you're gonna go through with it anyway. Uh what you don't want to do is use your 110 point unit of stealthy murder elves to charge into a 50-point screening unit of Imperial Guard 
just for the satisfaction of imagining the whirring chain swords and terrified screams of the monk high as your elegant aspect warriors consign them to the commissar's next casualty report like that feels kind of awesome for 45 seconds while you roll dice and your opponent clears the models but your scorpions will then be promptly killed on your opponent's turn with minimal resource expenditure and that's a bad trade like and i understand the temptation to want to do it it's it's fun to play high casualty games of 40k but um but that's tactically a bad move and it's not even narratively a sensible one that's like your elves value their lives the, the lives of five elves are not going to be traded for for 10 uh chaff humans so even, even if you're a narrative player like check yourself bro that's not the that's not the story you want to tell um that said you can position your scorpions to kill both a key enemy unit and block some aggressive enemy m unit from moving on your opponent's movement phase you absolutely should do that even if it means your scorpions are going to die generally your scorpions are not going to survive your games most of the time they, they they won't um but one of the chief advantages of scorpions is that they they're good for trading up that is they can trade their lives to destroy something more valuable uh they also slow your opponent down and prevent her units from being able to position themselves advantageously on turn one because they're kind of move blocked or because they have to be held back to actually kill the scorpions so your scorpions don't get yet another turn of murder mayhem uh and that's one of the reasons to do the thing that i suggested earlier where you run them into a big vehicle or a monster to create a major log jam in your opponent's backfield that that can be super useful some craft world lists score primary objectives by creating so many problems in your opponent's deployment zone that she just doesn't really have the resources to keep your effete space elves from scoring in the midfield despite their fragility a lot of craft world's lists score primary objectives as i said before by by scoring late others score by forcing your opponent to choose between preventing these like wrecking ball units in the backfield from creating havoc or trying to stop you from scoring in the midfield you, you give her like two bad choices at some point i'm going to make a video just on uh how to play primary objectives but those are two very common strategies and certainly the second of those scorpions help with a great deal now it's worth mentioning as i did before uh that some top players pretty much never set the scorpions up for the the turn one ambush I, it's not most but there's some very good eldar players who just almost never do that and they almost exclusively start them in a transport or in the webway or they just plan on always putting them into reserve with phantasm after like threatening the opponent to trick them and i will say that even though i'm a i'm an ambush on turn one if possible guy one advantage to this other method or if you do end up having to pull back your scorpions is that if your scorpions are not entering play way out in front of your army uh, if they're coming in on the mid board after turn one, it's much easier to buff them with powers like guide, which allows them to reroll all their misses or enhance, which gives them plus one to hit. And this is a particularly strong combo on the Exarch with crushing blow, because as you rem may remember, all of the hits with crushing blow auto wound. So if you get guide or enhance on there, which has them hitting on twos, a squad with an XR can single-handedly do some serious damage even to like a T8 target with a three up save or a four up invuln uh, just by virtue of weight of dice that are auto wounding. Uh, that, that said, if you do want to get those same buffs on a unit of scorpions that's running into your opponent's deployment zone on turn one, it is possible without making a big sacrifice. So what you can do is you can have a psyker on a jet bike, make an advance move. So think like a warlock with enhance. 22 inches into the midfield to get within 18 inches of the scorpions cast the power and then have another psyker that's 18 inches back from that front psyker on the jet bike cast quicken to let that warlock on the jet bike or maybe farseer with guide or whatever scoot 22 inches back to safety if it's a farseer you can do other fun stuff like throw doom on something in the backfield or executioner people hate that if you're a newer player executioner is awesome it it will it will always do well for you um and the other thing would be if you're running psychic secondaries you could have your farseer cast psychic interrogation and then spend the cp that lets you also cast a power and throw guide on your scorpions and, and then run away so there are lots of combos that make it possible 
to get a buff on a forward scorpion unit, but it is more resource intensive because A, you're spending the psychic power and B, you need to also have quicken and maybe there's a strands die in there to make sure you succeed on quicken so the psyker doesn't die. So it's more resource intensive, but it can be pretty powerful. If your scorpions aren't attacking something that's really hard to wound though, you probably don't need to bother with that. They're probably gonna seriously wreck the target anyway. Okay, so usually in the, in these videos, this would be the point where um, I talk about the greatest obstacles to using the particular unit well, uh, but I've I've already done that in this case because the two biggest issues with scorpions are how to handle not getting first turn and what to do if your opponent doesn't present you with a viable first turn target. I've already talked about those. The only thing that I think I haven't really addressed that can be a pain in the butt is Overwatch. Uh, your scorpions do have some of the best armor available to a feat elf infantry, but they're not exactly robust. They're still T3 models with one moon uh, and a five up invuln they can fall back on. So most of the time though, it doesn't really matter because overwatch fire is only hitting on sixes. So in most cases, if you run the math, it's like, well, so maybe I lose one green elf ninja it's still totally worth doing if you're really unlucky you'll lose two but as i said before the exarch's doing most of the damage so it's kind of like okay but it's not a reason not to charge against some opponents with crazy volume of fire or something that auto hits like flamers uh you may need to think really carefully about how you're doing this so the obvious move is to try to position your scorpion when you make that initial move to set them up for the charge even if it means starting an inch or two further away, set them up so the other unit just doesn't have line of sight. So they just can't overwatch you. Those opaque walls that I mentioned on most tournament boards where the, the first floor of any two-story or greater ruin is just automatically counted as opaque. One advantage to that is it makes it much easier for your scorpions to charge something without, without suffering overwatch. Uh, if you're lengthening the charge, you can compensate for that by using strands of fate die, right? Because on a on a two, you can set one of your charge die automatically to a six, which makes the worst thing you can get a seven. And then if you're starting slightly further away, it isn't it isn't really a big deal. So that's that's one way to deal with it. Just clever positioning and use of strands of fate, uh, and maybe ghost walk if you have it and if you can get the cast on them based on where they are on the board, that might be a little tricky. Uh, another possibility, if your scorpions happen to be jumping out of a wave serpent, I mentioned that's a thing you can do earlier. You can always discharge the serpent shield to shut down overwatch. It's on the data sheet for the wave serpent, but usually you are better off just hanging onto the durability bonus for the tank. So in some instances, you do just need to rethink your target. Like Howling Banshees has the, have the advantage that nothing can overwatch them, but every now and then with your scorpions, there'll be something you really want to hit and you work it out and it's just... You have to pay attention to the Overwatch. There might be there might be targets that are, that will just really mess the squad up before they can get there. Uh, sometimes it means selecting a new a new target, but not usually. Usually you can play around it. Okay, I'm just about done here, but I I do want to just talk about that a little more about that and Scorpion virtue that I mentioned at the beginning of the video, and that is that they can find a place in virtually any list. There are certain builds where they're even better. Beltan, right? Beltan uh, have this stratagem that gives exploding sixes to any aspect unit. So you could do that for your scorpions and they would hit even hard. They'd have double exploding sixes, right? So the sixes would be generating two hits. That's, that's super good. Uh, there are some custom craft world bonuses that can increase either the damage output or the maneuverability of elf hunter killer so vengeful gives all your melee units exploding sixes that's super good on scorpions uh headstrong the open skies one those are both like movement bonuses that can be useful but the fact of the matter is that the data sheet on scorpions is strong enough that none of those bonuses are necessary and as good as those bonuses are you shouldn't build a list around your scorpions getting access to one of those things. If you're already thinking about running Vengeful or running Bell 10, then totally, like all the more reason why you should definitely have scorpions in there. And they can help with um, that difficult to perform craft world secondary 
Wrath of Cain, where you have to try to kill an enemy unit in the shooting phase with a shooty aspect, and then also with a melee aspect. Of course, of course, you need scorpions in lists that are going to try to pull that off. Uh, and and Bell Ten, if you're running Bell Ten, you're probably trying to make Wrath of Cain work for you. Um, but there just isn't. You don't need that stuff for them to be good. And there just isn't a type of list or build that cannot make good use of a squad of scorpions. So adding, if you don't already own a box of these, adding scorpions to your collection, if you've not already done so, is going to be a solid move regardless of what types of lists you like to play or what craft world you run. If you're at all interested in them, it's, it's worth having them in your collection. They can do work for you. I will say one particularly fun build for Scorpions. Uh, it, it's not a particular craft world. It's, it's a style of army. It's a little out of fashion right now. It's an alpha strike list. So an alpha strike list is a list designed to put such overwhelming pressure on an opponent in a single turn that they're just never able to recover. Uh, so if, if you were running this for craft worlds, it would definitely include Scorpions. Maybe you have Karen Dross and a unit of Scorpions with Crushing Blow and the Sword. And then you have two or three falcons which can make a turn one deep strike uh filled with howling banshees and dire avengers maybe there's a unit of shroud runners because they can move before the game begins and then again and they can shoot and then they can use that stratagem to throw out some mortal wounds uh you can even throw some war walkers in there which can like essentially scout deploy you, there, there's all kinds of cool stuff that you can do even some aircraft like if you're looking for a way to use a hemlock an alpha strike list is the way uh but there are all kinds of ways to build a list that can theoretically dump well over a thousand points of death dealing craft worlders into or adjacent to your opponent's deployment zone on turn one and just hit monstrously hard and this is not going to work for you in every matchup. There's a, there are matchups where this really doesn't work. There's lots of matchups in which is great. The fact that it's not consistently reliable makes it a marginal strategy for tournaments, certainly for major tournaments. But it can be so fun uh, if it's like a pseudo competitive build for your local club or in a small local like R RT Rogue Trader tournament, like a small. I don't know, eight person tournament or something. It, it's just super good time. Uh, it also plays really fast. If like, if, if you're not in for long games, um, cause it's either going to work or it's not. Uh, and that's, and that's sort of fun in its, its own way too. So r regardless though, of whether or not you're thinking of running an alpha strike list, should you find yourself charging with both striking scorpions and howling banshees? Cause I just mentioned that's the thing that happens in alpha strike lists, but even if you're not running alpha strike, one more thing, if you're charging with, Banshees and Scorpions on the same turn, remember to trigger the Scorpions first in the melee phase. Banshees confer light fast, uh, confer fight last on units that they charge, whereas Scorpions don't do that. So if you trigger the Banshees first, theoretically your opponent could spend two CP, interrupt, and just totally mess up your Emerald Aspect Warriors before they get their Chain Surds, Whirring, and the Manda Blasters, Manda Blasting. And the only reason generally that scorpions are able to survive rounds of combat is that they've already seriously messed up the thing that they're fighting. So if, if your opponent pulls off an interrupt, potentially your scorpions are just dead. So that's another thing. I guess I should have said that when I was talking about obstacles, but that's another thing you need to be very careful about. And again, it only comes up if you're charging with multiple units, but if you are, watch out for the interrupt, trigger your stuff that confers fight last first. Okay. So that's what I've got. Scorpions uh, are an A-list unit that appears in probably the majority of top craft world lists that do, do well at tournaments. They do require some significant finesse to use well, and they're not going to be the center point of any battle plan, but a single squad brings significant utility well in excess of its points cost. They're also one of the most iconic badass aspect units going all the way back to second edition, and so they get... Uh, I almost said kudos. Oh, I think it's because I brought up like 90s Karens earlier. I don't know. I don't know where that come from. comes from. But they, they, they're great. They're fantastic. And they should be honored for having been fantastic for so long. Aesthetically, if not always in the rules. They were pretty bad in 8th ed. All right. Many thanks to my patrons who make this content possible. Uh, but especially to I am Tib, who provided the last of the scorpion photos in this video. 
Uh, I'll also link his Instagram in the video description if in case you're interested in following him. Uh, my Patreons enjoy early access to these videos. They get access to an exclusive Discord channel and they get the opportunity to download the audio files from these videos to listen to them like podcasts. So if you're interested in joining the Discord or getting early access or being able to treat this like a podcast or you just want to support my content, please consider becoming a Patreon. I'll add a link to the video description. Thanks so much. Best wishes in your next campaign. Uh, I hope to be back soon with another unit focus video or perhaps a, unit, a video on playing primary objectives. Until then, if you have your own thoughts about how to use Scorpions well, please leave those in the comments below. Or if you just want to say hello and help out the algorithm, I appreciate that too. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Good night.